red, blue, and black and white. The inevitable consequence of all of this should deeply trouble Christians, who of any segment of our society understand the necessity of a strong government. The Bible teaches that God ordains government, appoints leaders, and requires obedience so that we might live peaceable lives. Why is this? God recognizes that among fallen humans in a fallen world, even a bad government is better than no government. No government leads to chaos and mob rule. When order breaks down, justice is inevitably undermined. As Augustine of Hippo argued, peace flows from order, and both are necessary preconditions to the preservation of liberty and some measure of human dignity and flourishing. This is why great leaders of the faith throughout history have held government in such high esteem. Some, such as John Calvin, considered the magistrate the highest of vocations. Of course, while we have a high view of government, it isn't a blank check. Christian doctrines, such as sphere sovereignty, subsidiarity, nothing should be done by a larger complex organization when a smaller organization can accomplish it. The balance of power and God's transcendent law must hold government in check. So if Washington has lost touch with the people, as Christians we should work fervently to reform these systems. Real reform may even have to come through an independent commission, like Securing America's Future Economy, SAFE, SAFE, for which Congressman Frank Wolf has tirelessly advocated. The Tea Party movement may have a lot of traction in America today, but it makes no attempt to present a governing philosophy. It simply seeks an outlet, an understandable one, for the brooding frustrations of many Americans. But anti-government attitudes are not the substitute for good government. We should be instructing people, enraged at the excesses of Washington and the growing ethical malaise in the capital, to focus their rage at fixing government, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We Christians are to be the best citizens, praying for our leaders and holding them in high regard, even as we push for the reforms desperately needed to keep representative government flourishing. Only when we funnel frustrations into constructive reformation can we expect a government that is truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. Until we have such a government, we will continue to witness today's civil war as the two factions fight for control. This is why we're seeing such hysterical rhetoric from the left, which, with the loss of the House in 2010, fears its losing its power, and power is all that matters. The right is just as bad. Some leaders now say that the Republicans will try to impose their will on everyone else an attitude repugnant to democratic governance. What's the solution? First, red Christians must reach out to blue Christians, and vice versa. Ideology must not divide believers. Second, Christians are not seeking political power, so we're not out to destroy perceived political enemies. Nor do we line up for the victor's spoils, as if we were just one more special interest group. Instead, we need to graciously contend and demonstrate that Christian truth is good for the right ordering of our lives, individually and collectively, and manifest our commitment to the common good by doing the things Christians do best, creating strong families, restoring relationships helping the poor, working for human rights. Christians are in a unique position to bring common grace to a deeply divided nation and offer something more than brief periods of peace between outbreaks of mortal combat every election cycle. In rejecting ideology and putting the common good first, we offer hope to America's warring factions.